Hello all, Rick here with a video concerning the destinations of the characters of Deep Space Nine as depicted in Apocrypha and canon to speculate where their lives may have taken them past the ending episodes of What We Leave Behind. As before with the Voyager crew, there are often several different paths penned by multiple authors, but generally these fall into two categories. The Star Trek Destiny timeline, or First Splinter timeline as it's called based on the books, and the Star Trek Online timeline, based on the games and short stories. Sometimes they agree on points, sometimes not. So I'll recount both to paint an idea of a character's future, with canon mentions of course trumping all. Starting off with the captain of Deep Space Nine, the emissary himself, Benjamin Sisko. After being saved by the prophets from the fire caves on Bajor, he was pulled into their celestial temple for an indeterminate amount of time. But even upon arriving there, he knew he would be returning at some point in the future. In books, this occurred relatively quickly, with him arriving back in 2376 on the day of his and Cassidy Yates' daughter's birth. While in the temple, however, he was able to reach out to people and influence certain events through prophetic visions, much like the prophets did on occasion. Subsequent events have him move to his planned home on Bajor with her and his family and continue his role as emissary for at least a year, turning down a promotion to admiral. Moving into the timeline of Destiny now, we have the renewed Borg invasion of 2381 that prompted him to return to active duty in Starfleet as captain of the USS New York. This time of conflict also coincided with the loss of his father, which caused him to reconsider his position in Starfleet, but ultimately he remained. He and his family eventually ended up on the Galaxy class USS Robinson and were still there by 2386. Star Trek Online has none of this, having him still within the Celestial Temple by 2411 and Deep Space Nine under the command of Captain Kurland here. Next up, Kira Norris. So in both continuities, Bajor joined the Federation, the only difference being the date. As such, Bajoran militia personnel were offered positions in Starfleet, and Kira maintained her Starfleet commission and became the commanding officer of Deep Space Nine. Here she remained in the position, juggling her duties to Bajor with the new requirements of a Starfleet officer and walking the political line that the commander of the station needed to. In 2378, she stepped down from the position and began her training as a Vedic, completing the training in three years. Eventually, by 2409, she had ascended to the position of Kai of Bajor. At first, I was not sold on this idea. I could see her remaining in Starfleet and DS9, and although her faith is incredibly important to her, I can't see her putting up with the demands of being such a prominent figure in it. There is a short story covering her position as Kai in this time, which sort of makes it a bit more believable and I think I'll link it in the description, but I do like how she is very much still Kira about the whole thing. Miles Edward O'Brien Well, in the far future of Star Trek, he was remembered as an integral part of Starfleet, which is great. But a little closer to the ending of DS9, saw him accept a teaching position on Earth at Starfleet Academy as a professor of engineering. With the destruction wrought on Cardassia at the hands of the Dominion, however, the Federation began working to help them rebuild, including the Andak project in 2376. This was an agricultural initiative to restore the long-abused natural biomes of Cardassia for sustainable farmland, headed by Keiko O'Brien, which meant that the family had to relocate there. Now the books also go on to have Deep Space Nine destroyed and a replacement built, which had O'Brien return as Chief Engineer in 2383, and he receives a promotion to Master Chief Petty Officer. Yes, O'Brien became Master Chief, interpret that as you will. Now, Esri Dax is an interesting one as she spends her initial time remaining on DS9, learning more about the previous Dax hosts and developing based on their experiences. This prompts her to switch divisions to command, and begins her path to captaincy, drawing on the hundreds of years of knowledge from Dax to do so. In 2380, the USS Aventine, Starfleet's first quantum slipstream vessel prototype was fielded and Esri selected as the second officer. However, in the Borg battles of the Destiny timeline, both the Captain and Exo were killed, so she ended up in command far earlier than expected. This is where she remained, taking a promotion to Lieutenant Commander, and then Commander, and finally Captain over the years. 
In 2401 STO continuity, she and Bashir retire in protest from Starfleet over the Federation's inaction to get involved in the Klingon Gorn War and return to Trill together, where Bashir opens a private practice. Eventually, Esri resumes her old posting on the Aventine, and by 2410 she is still in command of the ship and undertaking missions alongside her husband and their children. The Destiny timeline has her and Bashir split up as he embarks on a very different path. Speaking of, Julian Bashir. So this one diverges quite a bit. I've already alluded to his path in Esri's potential future, but in the Destiny timeline he and Esri sadly split up. Boo. Bashir remained aboard DS9 in this timeline of events, eventually rekindling his romance with Serena Douglas, who was now in Starfleet Intelligence and secretly a Section 31 agent. He then goes on to create a cure for the growing Andorian reproductivity problem in 2385, but it involves classified research and genetic alteration which gets him discharged from Starfleet. He then goes on to infiltrate Section 31 by accepting their recruitment attempts and exposes the organisation to the public and bests the control program running it all. While I don't object to the whole Section 31 thing, I do think that I prefer his chronology winding up with him on the Aventine. This is where Star Trek Online has him as the Chief Medical Officer. However, with the recent alterations to the first Splinter timeline, the existence of the USS Aventine is now in question, with Admiral Janeway's USS Dauntless appearing to be the prototype for Federation slipstream travel. Worf has recently had his future rewritten in the Prime timeline, and if they hold true to what they've written, then he is the captain of the Enterprise E now, or at least as of 2387. After DS9, we know he accepted the role of the Federation Ambassador to Kronos and left with Martok to undertake that role. In 2379, he returns to the Enterprise for Riker and Troy's wedding and remained aboard for the subsequent Shinzon incident. After the loss of command data and Riker departing for the Titan, he elected to remain aboard in the role of First Officer, with Picard stepping away to manage the Romulan evacuation in 2382, Worf was appointed for the position as Captain. However, objections were raised over his past reprimands, but it was ultimately decided that it would foster relations with the Klingon Empire if he accepted. Currently, this is where we leave him, as his fate and that of the Enterprise E are still unannounced as of this video. In later life, however, he is often depicted as returning to Kronos to resume his role as ambassador between the Klingon Empire and Federation. Odo is an interesting one, as he does return to the Great Link to cure them of the Section 31 affliction and spreads his experiences of solid life among them. This brings a slight level of compassion to the Great Link, and therefore the Dominion, allowing for a less militant approach on occasion. However, the Dominion is still the Dominion, and change does not come overnight. He makes the occasional foray back through the wormhole to visit Bajor, but for the most part his duties are bound up with the Dominion and his people. In 2410, however, he returns to the stage at the head of a Dominion fleet and enters the Alpha Quadrant to help the Federation and Bajor against the return of the Herc. His desire to foster cooperation between the two galactic powers still very much the focus of his work. Additionally, as changelings are fundamentally immortal, it is a role he is suited to take on, as the millennia old Dominion is going to be a slow force to turn around, and they have fostered much resentment that they have to undo. And I could not not mention Nog. His last appearance saw him promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade, where he continued to serve on Deep Space Nine under Kira's command. According to various books, he takes on roles in both security and engineering, and eventually leaves the station around the mid-2380s. From here he becomes involved in the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, serving on several ships in that wing including the USS Challenger, and works with both Montgomery Scott and Geordie LaForge. For a time in 2397 he is the Chief Engineer on the Enterprise E, and by 2410 he is a Captain. He then goes on to command the USS Chimera, and takes part in numerous events in that timeline. Whatever events the shows ultimately canonise, it is a fact that he must have accomplished great feats in his tenure within Starfleet, as by the 32nd century, some 800 years after him, there is a vessel named the USS Nog, NCC 325070. So clearly, he had a notable career. So with those characters all wrapped up, 
There is one final point I'd like to put out there. The Star Trek book chronology has recently been categorised as its own timeline in the official canon, while the prime timeline has continued on in its own series of books. This was done so as not to overwrite and invalidate the Destiny timeline, and I'm currently compiling notes on those books, but it does mean that any character's future is up in the air now, however inspiration is often taken from these apocryphal tales. Heads Reed Dax and Julian Bashir seem to currently be the most potentially altered by future events, what with Dax's whole ship being in question. That would fundamentally alter the direction of their tale. Personally, I don't mind as long as they remain together. I'm soft-hearted for their romance story. Personally, when it comes to the fates of Sisko and Kira, I enjoy the endings for them that have Sisko return and live out his life on Bajor with his family. If I had it my way, this is where he would stay, in his role as Emissary and enjoying his peaceful retirement while helping Bajor. On the flip side of this, I like the notion that Kira would remain in Starfleet, taking command of DS9 and all that entails, a native Bajoran leading this important station. It creates a bit of a switch between Sisko and Kira, with Benjamin finding a home and purpose on Bajor, and with Kira swapping out and finding a place watching over it within Starfleet. There are other characters like Quark and Jake and Garrick, but that's enough for one video. Covering the rest would bloat this one out even more, and there are always more characters to examine. I'm saying I'll probably do a part two to this one to cover them, but for now, thank you for watching this video. I've been Rick, and I'll see you next time for another one. Goodbye. Oh, I almost forgot about Morn. Well, he.